Um, today, we're going to be looking at just sort of an overview, like I said, of the multiple choice questions. And then I'm going to go through how I write questions. And I know that might seem backwards since most of you won't be writing questions, although I think there are some teachers in the crowd. So that's, you know, that's cool. But I think understanding how they get constructed will help you. And it might actually make it a little stress relieving in terms of how you prepare for them. I'm not sure. And then we have some practice questions. So here's the um, overview slide. So, yep, real quick, once you, if you want to refresh your the actual AP test, um, you're going to have 55 questions, 55 minutes. And either um, at this point, you're either one of two people, either you're like, oh, I got this. I probably got the groove. And, or or you're on the other side, which is like, oh, what am I supposed to do? One minute per question? It sounds really, um, really scary. Don't worry. Um, uh, we'll get you used to the rhythm. So um, there's that. It's 40% of your score. So if you do well in the multiple choice, so so um, the AP test works in a manner that you don't have to do well in every part. If you're if you're better in test taking, so you can just focus on um, you can focus um, your attention and doing well in the multiple choice, and you can um, you can like have some lay um, leeway on the on the essays or vice versa. If you think you're not a good test taker uh, in the multiple choice, you can um, focus on like improving your, your, um, your score in the essay portion, but, or the short answer, but I recommend just being well-rounded in every area. So that's why you're here right now. And stimulus based questions are more on set than two to five questions. So usually there's an image or a text document. I prefer images because I love observing things. And they're just going to ask you about like AP skills. Like causation, continuity, and change, um, compare and contrast, something along those lines, um, contextualization, stuff like that. So, so talking about stimuli, they usually come under two categories. So, one is the primary source. So, they are actual accounts during the time. So, when you, whether you're in Rome, you're in Latin America, you're in like the Western Front during World War One, whether you're in Europe. West, um, in the Brit Britain during the Industrial Revolution. These are eyewitness accounts. These are actual accounts. So like they're preserved to, to like maintain like, historical accuracy. They're, they're like the actual stuff. So they're accounts from the time. And then there's secondary stores. Usually they're dated like 1900s, 2000s, where they usually grabbed their texts, their maps, their charts. They're, they're analyzing the history behind it. So you might say like, oh, um, the growth of the Mongol Empire. That's the secondary source. But a primary source would be like an account by either Genghis Khan or his envoy or someone like that. So you don't really you don't really have to memorize the definition, but but just by knowing the difference um, matters when you interpret them for like what's happening around it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, pictures and paintings are pr pretty much primary sources as well. Um, yeah, actually, paintings and pictures are usually primary sources. Usually, usually. they draw, they're like interpretation with the artists during that time. Like, oh, like the trade between this empire and this empire. Usually, yeah. Um, we're talking about, um, yeah, but it's important to like look at the actual, like, there's like a mini, like, note, footnote, the, um, not footnote, but like a caption. You can just look at the time and see if it's, it's, it's from a historian or an actual person living at the time. So just be careful about that. And most of them in the multiple choice section are um, primary sources. And so I only have one secondary source in here. When I looked at released exams since AP World went to this format, there's only three. But in all three of those, there was one set of multiple choice questions with um, secondary source stimulus. So in two weeks, I'll be back and I'm going to be doing short answer questions. And those always have a secondary source stimulus with them as well one of those so that's kind of there's usually one set from the multiple choice and one set um okay. well we'll practice that we have i have one in here so let's uh let's roll it's the egypt one if you want to scroll down to it and kind of get started so what this slide here and there's a whole bunch of text there what this what this slide um shows you is how i um go through um, when I go to make questions. And this is also a little bit for teachers who are out there, like, how do you do this? Um, but it's also, I think, for students, interesting to kind of see where do these things come from. And I wrote questions for Albert.io for a couple of years. It's a little side hustle. So I wrote 
I don't know, I think there's about 150 that got published. Some of those are on the pre-1200 time period, so they're now gone. But when I was doing that, it was always much easier to just start with a unit, you know, to find um, like what topic or content area you want to be and then find a stimulus and then get more specific from there. So all of the sources that um, I'm going to show you here, I wrote the questions from, I started just with the general topic and that's industrialization, imperialism or revolutions. Those are the three big topics in units five and six and then migration. I didn't get to. But so that's three. It's like, okay, well, it'd be an image. And then I kind of thought, you know, I used to teach AP Euro and I've taught it world history since 1990. And, you know, it's just like, what are some cool sources? And then and a couple things that I want actually looking for something. So you should just kind of know that, like, when you look at the source, you should think, like, what content might the person who wrote this, whether that's your teacher, or the college board, or even if the college board wrote it, your teacher still selected it. There's, you know, they're to, to use. So what's the main idea that this is, you know, about? What is, you know, what's the big idea? What's the big idea here? And so then I have a link there to the CED that's down in the resources for this stream. That's the course and exam description. And if you open that up in a third tab, you can see that some of the answers are like straight from there or loosely paraphrased from there. Um, like the actual content. So then kind of look, so that'd be my, my second step. And then I would take a closer from that, and this is in Jed will kind of show you how this works from uh, his viewpoint as a student, but then take a real closer look at the stimulus and see what kind of details are in here. And then what can we uh, do with, um, you know, what can we do with that? Meaning like what details are in there? And then finally, every question relates to one of these uh, hit, um, skills. Those are the five, five of the six processes. So also always be some sort of skill. You want to kind of look look for that. So, so how would you prepare for such a thing? And sometimes um, Jed and I both monitor the intercom questions. That's a little walkie-talkie deal that comes up when you're on the fiveable site, where someone's like, "Hey, how is your class going?" Um, and oftentimes kids will be like, hey, I've got a multiple choice test around. How do I prepare for it? Well, the most important preparation you can do is before the night before the exam, and that's to read. And the reason for doing that is not necessarily what you think. You know, it's not all the trivia. Like, that literally is trivia, what we did beforehand. Like, you don't have to know every single one of those things. But it's just a way to give you an idea of what are some possible things you might use when you write. But... The reason you want to read is because the, the test, a stimulus-based multiple choice test, is mostly reading. When I make one for my class, I aim for 3,750 words. That's about what I figured with our time class time and um, the age of students I have. I teach 11th graders. That's a lot of words, and those are usually 40 questions. So, you know, the AP test itself, you're going to be looking at over 5,000 words. And so the only way really to get better at a test of reading is to read. So, so doing your reading is really honestly the best advice. But what else, though? So what about the night before? You know, because the night before comes and maybe you've, you know, you've done as much reading as you can. Well, when you're reviewing your notes um, or when you're thinking about the content, you wanna think what are the big ideas here and how are there examples that fit into those big ideas? You, you can't know everything, like no one knows everything. Um, there's a great tip in the chat there. No one does. Like if I were to reread chapter 36, which is where we are in my textbook tonight, I've read that chapter two or three times, I would learn something like nobody retains everything. So you want to figure out what kind of categories can you put some things into. So if you do have notes, the best way to get ready, I think, for a multiple choice test that's got stimulus in it is to go through those notes and like code them with color or annotate them in some way that how do we see the big ideas and how do the things connect with each other? So. Yeah, great. Coding is good. 
So I'm going to show you a set of questions here, and this is actually the middle stimulus. When you, if you are clicked over, if you follow the big green button and take a look at the stimuli, we take a look at this. So this is, I mean, again, it's not a mystery. This is from the Wikipedia page on industrialization or like textile industry in Britain or something. And so it's a, it's a picture that I found is like industrialization is one of the big ideas in this unit, the big idea maybe in unit five. So we want to have a picture to go with that. And I'm going to show you some questions here in a second where I already have the answers marked so that you can see how the answers, because when a, someone's writing the question, start with the stimulus and they're thinking of the question type and then they're they're going to write the answer next. That's the next thing they'll write is the answer. So kind of seeing that without the distractors can give you an idea of how they work and maybe help you get inside them a little bit when you're doing that. So if we take a look at this, maybe in the chat, what kinds of things do you notice? These are five big parts of industrialization and they're not all in the picture, but how do we see any of these things in this image? Feel free to drop some observations in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What do you notice yeah. about the clothing? Yeah, go ahead. Look at, sorry, sorry. Um, when you look at when you look at the stimuli, like primary source in general, like you don't have to like focus on like if you know that it's let's for example in this case, you know it's an industrial. You shouldn't have to look for everything. You have to say, oh, wait, there's some machines. Oh, where's the where's the where's the gender dynamics? Oh, it's there. So now you only have limited time. So. Um, Usually, finding two or more trends is good, but you can all you can all, you can always stay on like at least one or two. That's a safe bet, you know. When you find observe when you, when you do observations, and the more you find, the more it'll help you once you actually read the questions below the stimuli stimulus. So there we go. Right. Okay. And then you should also pay attention to oh yeah there you are. So people are yeah. noticing a lot of useful things. And you should also kind of do a, like a little bit of a reality check. Like this is. Do you think the factories looked like this? Like it's representing some things. And this guy put it in his book. Does anything seem like not right or like it's not the way it was? Because often these primary source rep representations are meant to like convey a point. So I have three questions here that go with this and they're loosely based on some released questions. So gender and age be a thing. This is a question that would be the kind of developments and processes question. And this best illustrates language you see a lot. And that just means is an example of. Right? Yeah, they're not outdoors, right? <laughs> but it looks like it's light enough to be outdoors. So here, gender is one of the big things that happens in or one of the big variables, factors in industrialization. So. Oh, our heads are in the way in terms of seeing what, Logan, like the, all the choices. The question, the question's in blue here, like right in the middle. Like, where are our heads? Oh, okay. Um, oh, I see now, because um, if you look at the boxes, um, some, some, some words are blocked. So let's see if I can read it for you. So... Uh -huh. I think um, the, the part of the coverage says C is working class people often live in neighborhoods and with unsanitary living conditions and high levels of crime. And I think D was during the 1800s, women, blah, blah, blah. Right. Okay. Let me think about how to, yeah, because we're in the bottom left hand corner. You can't see the bottom of B. All right. Hmm. I'd forgotten about this variable. All right. Well, did you read the. I think what we can do here is exit out. Okay, I'm gonna end the show. Stop. Actually, I can just um, I can just link the um, I just link the slides. Yeah, yeah, why don't you guys do that? Jed's gonna drop the slide link you in the chat. Slide. That way, we can kind of keep rolling a little better. Okay, sorry yep. about that. I will remember this for next week if you join join in. Got that going on. So Jed will drop that in there. Then you can also have them to practice. So one of the things that I wanted to get at, and somebody somebody noticed this, um, that the man seemed to be kind of in a power position, not quite a power pose, but um, yeah, Jed's a hero. Um, 
So this that women were working in these factories and children, like that's one of the big ideas. And somebody mentioned that here. So that's one of the things that I was looking for. So when you see that, you always want to think, does it seem right or wrong? So you see a woman working and a few of you mentioned in the chat, oh, yeah, yeah, women were working in these factories. That's part of what was going on. They weren't in charge. So then when you see that in the answer, it's like, oh, OK, there it is. All right. The next question is about that sourcing and it gets at that idea. So when I was looking at this picture, I'm like, this does not look quite right. This looks way too nice. There's way too much space. Um, so then the question would be, what explains that? Well, this is probably why. So if someone's gonna write a sourcing question, they're gonna be thinking of those hip, happy hippo things. So if you see the, um, you know, these choices here, that's, you know, A is historical context, B is audience, C is point of view, and D is purpose. So I did that on purpose. So you could kind of see, you kind of just go through that checklist and think what seems to be influencing this. This is not a super common multiple choice question type because that gets, you know, assessed on the DBQ, but it, and on the short answer question. But it is, it is important and it kind of helps you to see what's happening. And then there's sometimes there's questions like this, like you might have noticed, where you don't actually need the stimulus, or if you just had the title of the stimulus, but not the picture. There's always at least two, usually more, of the questions in the set that where you couldn't answer without the stimulus. Like the question wouldn't even make any sense. Like that last question. It, it's all about the picture. But sometimes there's questions that are really just about the topic. Yeah. Um, the students all recommend doing that, Tanya. And so that's not something that I had thought, but Jed and Varun and other students who've done these streams are big proponents of doing that. I think especially with text, like if so that you know what yeah. you're reading for. Yeah, go ahead, Jed. It depends. Um, for me, when I was taking the test, when it's usually an image, well, I can, you can just take a quick look and then you can um, actually look at the image first and answer the questions. But if it's a long, um, long text, um, textual document, I would usually, um, yeah, I would um, probably read the questions first. Like I, I would, I would focus on the statement. Um, I would read the first two because usually, like the later, like the third, fourth question, usually are connected to like big picture topics, so they're not even related to the image. Per, um, even so you can do a quick skim like focus on keywords so instead of looking at what is the best effect it's just look at the like the latter have the question like effect or um continuity and then or um or like what like um, what feature was um was um prominent in the image something like that uh, in the in the text so you can do either a quick skim either way it works but i would recommend if it's an image you can read, you can do the document first and questions. If it's a text, you should be skimmed first and then go back to read. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, so you're kind of looking for those words. Now you don't have to memorize these things, but that's why I put this here in the lower right. So the, all the questions are gonna be dealing with one of those things. And so it's a lot of different things, but you can look for those keywords. So like when Jed said effect, which would be something that people would look for, well, then that's, you know, a causation question, you know, continuity or change, similar or different. Um, one in three on this list of skills are gonna be those, a historian could best use this as evidence of, um, or a, um, you can use this to illustrate, this is an example of, well, that's how those work. Right. People are ans answering questions, asking questions, any? Just feel free to drop those either in the chat or in the, in the comments there. Yeah, that is, I think, the most common that illustrates. It's probably the most common. All right, so now we're gonna practice. And actually, um, we have, I'm going to let Jed talk about this, and I'll answer your question here. All right. Oh, yeah. I can see the, the text. 
But anyway, so... So here are Jed's top four tips. All right. So first, reading questions first. Um, okay, so I, I, I know it's kind of it's kind of weird. But I just said earlier that oh, just skim skim the text first. But um, especially for text documents, I recommend reading the question uh, reading as in mark key terms, um, like key um, not key terms key like what they're at, look at what they're asking. Don't focus on the what is the blah blah blah. Just just stare at the the latter half of the page and so you see like either effect continuity change or even what's the main idea express i mean so you can just say main idea and so this is where process elimination helps you a lot so let um you know once again uh reading going back reading is recommended but if you're if you're if, if it's the worst case scenario you can use the image to advantage for it especially if the first two questions so this is where you, you can formulate the plan of attack so if you look um, look at the image once again. Look at the image or a document, and then focus on like whatever prominent things you read. If, if it's talking about social status, let's say uh, gender inequality, you can um, look. If, you, if there's an answer choice that um, talks about like um, like technology or a different theme, like culture, you can already exit out because it's not related. It's irrelevant. And the more answers you mark down, like also only mark out like blatantly incorrect options if you're like torn between two choices that's another that's another that's another thing we, we'll talk about but try to like narrow down like in, in, as many confusers as you can so look for what you're looking for in the question yeah yeah so you, you want as, as, identify as many um we call this as many trends as you can so i i like using images as an example because they're easier to look at so let's say it's a trade it's a map it's showing tr um the growth of trade in china let's say during the 1700s so if there's an answer choice about religion or let's say it's about uh, talk about neo-confucianism or any other any other irrelevant terms like poli um not not necessarily politics but more in like uh, obvious like opposites from the, uh, the main central te theme then you can just start eliminating it and also look at the wording of both um both the questions and the excerpt um what i what we mean what i mean when i say that is you know, like probably in the excerpt usually in the text document you're, you're probably going to encounter a lot of technical terms so you don't have to spend like the, the next five minutes just like oh what's um what's like proselytizing or what's what's um or any technical word don't just just use the context just have the general idea don't focus on word per word just look at the general idea if, if it's a narration if it's a battle they just say like oh um we went in the battlefield they were and we got the, we got some slaves and to to trade to the other kingdom like get the general gist don't focus on each each little detail and same goes for the questions. A lot of kids actually get questions wrong because they, instead of like, there's a difference between scanning, like what I'm saying, what I'm talking about earlier, and skimming. Skim, um, scanning, scanning the page real quick is just like saying you see effect. You see like what is it? Oh, I actually know. Like, um, what is the? Like you just focus on the exact keywords. Uh, you also want to focus on like, once again, I'm not saying focus on the what is the like the first few words but focus on like hi, like usually in capital letters so like not except that means that means the other way around doesn't mean it doesn't mean like or least like usually because you're because you're, you're hardwired and thinking like i'm picking the best option the best description of the document but there are some questions like the following trends are let's say the following trends are expressed in this document except if you read, if you didn't read that, if you misread it, except then you'll get the entire question wrong, and um, 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 we don't want that. So there we go. Also, lastly, we want to contextualize contextualize information. What I what, what I mean is that you know, remember when I told you there, there are um, you probably you probably already saw those, but whenever whenever a document is presented to you. You're probably gonna time date like a date, a time, a title, the document. Let's say the declarations of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, like um, 18th century. So you want to zoom in on the time 
period. So um, like think of everything you know in that region. So let's say it's talking about the French Revolution. You don't have to worry about anything else in China, in Latin America. Just think about what is happening in Europe, in France during that time. So you can think of the revolution. You can talk about how, why are they rebelling? Um, you don't have to like spend the rest of the time just thinking what's what's happening. But um, just think, just having just like get a habit ready <laughs> once you read the questions. You know when you um, this is just another general idea. So there we go. Speaking of the French Revolution. So here we have a very common French image. You might have seen this. This was a print, and you've, I've actually seen it reversed, and I've actually seen it with the people wearing different colors. So it was, in, you know, the outline was engraved or something, and then the engraving was inked, and then it was printed. So it can be like reversed, like viewed from behind. People seen this image. It's pretty common in textbooks. There's another one that's pretty common too, with a guy um, on his hands and knees. We have that. So let's take a look here. So people who are asking about the French Revolution in the questions and upvoting that, we're going to take a look at two different French Revolution questions here. So looking at this, just you can uh, drop in the chat there. Which of the questions do you think you can eliminate just based on the you know, things we've been, which ones can we get rid of? you're reading there. So I bolded representation of, so it says game, right? But it seems unlikely, right? So you want to see, and, and here's the thing, like A is true. They're, the French monarchy was absolutist, but it's not represented in the picture. So this is a question that's looking at like developments or processes, right? That's right, Arav. And why can we eliminate C? Uh, the French family was patriarchal. Yep. Yep. A, because we don't see a king, right? Do we, right? Do we, we don't see gender difference here? <laughs> yeah, the first thing I thought I saw is that, um, you know, there's, um, there's like, look at their clothing, you know, it, it's a hint. Right. So the answer here is B, and this is usually, this shows the inequality in France before the revolution. So give yourself a hug if you answered B, and don't worry if you didn't. It is, right? It is B. This one? Okay. I'll take a look at the next, next question then. Same set. Which one's here? So this question is, says, brings context into it, inferred, if we don't know for sure, about the artist's primary purpose. So this is a sourcing question. I, uh, my daughter joined in the background there, so I turned around. So again, can we eliminate some here? And then why don't we go ahead, we can put our, our guesses. What do you think this was trying to do? Pretty, pretty famous image here of that. All right. Okay. Yeah. This one's clear. We're rolling. Okay. So we see the, the peasant bent over. All right. We're doing good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not celebratory, right? It's not, uh, yeah, for Logan there for A. So yeah, last one was B. Yeah, and there's a little bit of a lag here, so I have to be uh, at the purpose. Oh, purpose for this one was C, and then this one here. How did it differ? Like what? I don't know about this question here because the, the, what this is asking is how did what actually happen? So the right answer will be something that actually happened that um, isn't reflected in the image. Right. <laughs> the peasant 
and the rabbit are not friends. And in the feudal agreements that governed uh, French country life, peasants were often forbidden from hunting rabbits. And so this the rabbit in here is not like a random detail. That's one of the things in the in the complaints that peasants sent in as part of the revolution, they were angry that they couldn't hunt rabbits and maybe birds. I don't know if any of you live in a household where people try to grow things outside or you try to do that yourself. Like my wife likes to grow things. She does not like rabbits. Yeah. How does your mom feel about rabbits, Tanya? Yep. And so the peasants couldn't hunt the rabbits because nobles like to hunt them for game. But so that one's not right. So peasants did rebel. That is true. Um, A is not true, but B, B is not true. Um, or B is true, excuse me, but it is also shown in the picture. So B isn't a difference. B would be a similarity. D is also not true, so you can eliminate that one. All right, so that makes it C, which is true, but not shown in the picture, All right? That's kind of how you might work through this one. Now, this is a harder, I think that's a harder question, even though you can eliminate two of the choices. Okay. All right. Um, with D, um, there's, D isn't true because women took part in revolutionary action. Right. D also is not shown in the picture. So that's that's correct. So it has to be both things. So that's why it's a bit of a puzzle. So women did. So you might learn about the March on Versailles or women in the crowds in Paris. Um, there were women ripping down the Bastille. Bastille. Um, so you should know that urban women in particular were really involved in the revolution. OK, so with the next one, then, is the um this stimulus here you can find speaking of women the alarm de gouge mm. yes good the alarm de gouge which is in your reading and then here's the questions so again on what i did is i went through here and i um and i just took out the the words that jed might scan for in the questions So then as you're reading it, you kind of know what to read for. And some of you might have read it already, but other people will probably be reading it for the first time. And on the document that's linked, there's actually a little more of an excerpt. So I'll read this for people who are on tiny screens, or you can read on your own. This is from Alain de Gouge, who is a French writer. And she wrote this, The Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the female citizen actually continues in 1791 and she wrote mothers daughters sisters female representatives of the nation asked to be constituted as a national assembly considering that ignorance neglect or contempt for the rights of women are the sole causes of public misfortunes and governmental corruption they have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural inalienable and sacred rights of woman so that by being constantly present to all the members of the social body, this declaration, oops, I have to go to the stimulus page because my thingy is covering it up. This declaration may always remind them of their rights and duties so that by being liable at every moment in comparison with the aim of any and all political institutions, the acts of women's and men's powers may be more fully respected. And so that by being founded henceforward on simple and incontestable principles, the demands of the citizenesses may always tend toward maintaining the constitution, good morals, and the general welfare. Woman is born free and remains equal in, to man in rights. Social distinctions may be based only on common utility Two, the purpose of all political associations is the preservation of the natural and imprescribable rights of women, woman and man. These rights are life, liberty, property, security, and especially resistance to oppression. So let's see what we have here. 
Did anyone recognize that language that is modeled on some fairly famous language, like very closely? Does that sound familiar at all? And and maybe did anyone has anyone read this in class? <laughs> all right. Well, that is patterned like exactly on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And it was published as a pamphlet. So she just published that thing, just handed it out. It's revolution, man. Woman. All right. So the first question here is a content question. So um, I guess technically this is the third historical thinking process. Like, what's the argument? So that's just interpreting the document. So which of these things? Are women more capable? Should the status quo be maintained to continue contributing to the economy? Should women be given more? <laughs> right? Do you think it only, so we have C or D, that's right. So C is, what makes D different is it's saying it's just politics. Does it seem restricted to politics? Yep. Usually there's that one confused their answer that um that has like one word that makes it entirely wrong so in this case it'd be solely so i'm jumping the gun but if everybody answered c good job yep it's c yep okay good job now this is a causation causation question so like what is one of the things that contributed to this yeah, and Melissa had dropped that note in the chat too, that words like that, like Jed saying extreme language should be a red flag at least. It's usually not true here. So we're taking a look at this. Which of the following was the result of So even though, right, and that's all part of that enlightenment thinking that's happening in the background. Yeah, so this one is B. And again, these are all things, all of these lines all come right from the um, course and exam description. Yeah, all right, Sarthag. Keeping it, keeping it real. You got that sweet fiveable thing on your name, too. I appreciate that. It's branding. So this isn't the first time that that, that had happened. Right, we we'll do a new stimulus now on industrialization. Here's a graph. So this is stimulus number three. It's a little bit, um, it's not necessarily confusing, but it is, um, if you look at the dates, they're not uniformly spaced. So you should know that. Hey, there we go. You've learned about industrialization. You're good to go. And some people do that before they do the revolutions. Other people do it after. Oh, okay. You've learned already. Okay, good, good. All right. So you might want to just take a look. When you get a graph like this, you're kind of looking for what's the general, what's the general pattern that's like happening here? Like what's the big idea? Yeah, that will happen with industrialization, Tanya. Yeah, okay. So take a peek. Now, so this is showing the global dimension of it, which is important, of course, here. Jed made the note in the slides that you can annotate graphs, right? So you can take a second to wrap your mind around it. So it always leads up to 100%. So the total amount of things being manufactured is going up, but this just shows where the biggest percent is. So if you look at 1750, what's the biggest chunk? You know, where things are being manufactured. So we know from the class that China until about 1800 is the center of the world economy. You can see that here. And if it's not China, it's South Asia. But then how does that change? Then what's the change over time? That's always the history thing, right? Okay. Yeah, so where is England in this? So this one's using, there's different words we can use for these places. Right. Thank you, Arav. Okay, so if we take a look here, now this question is, and sometimes this will happen with graph questions where it's not asking about the whole graph. So you can even put your, you can put your hand on the text. Like you can put your hand on the test. 
or on your screen here. And so from 1750 to 1880. So what's the what's the big trend that you might be seeing there? Yeah, this red starts out so small. Fun fact, when the English East India Company first arrives in South Asia, the Mughal Empire is 25 times the size of, you know, England in population. Like for every English person, there's 25 people in the Mughal Empire. Oh, so D says the British development of mechanized textile production. So which thing is going to cause the change? So that means why, what's the big change from 1750 to 1880? Well, the big change is, right? yep, so it is D, that is correct. A is true for the beginning of the period earlier, but the question's asking about the change. Right, so industrialization would be the short answer to this question. So that's what it shows. All right, let's do another one. So this question is about the second half of the graph or another chunk. And that would be, how could you use this data to support one of these conclusions? Okay, we're gonna be doing, um, there's some in Sarthak, there's some in the replays for all of them, but in two weeks, I'm gonna be back doing, um, I'm gonna be doing uh, short answer questions. And then uh, Melissa will be doing um, LEQ, I think, if or someone will for that. And we will have DBQ things. Yeah. So two weeks, I'm going to write some fresh SAQs. Okay. Oh, got some wording problems here. Oh, replace. Yeah, yeah. So they're covered. Okay. So C is asking, if you scroll up to Jed, drop the link to the slides in the in the chat. But so C says US participation in World War I shifted the global balance of power. Ah, right. Yep, that's the key. US was a net receiver of millions of immigrants between 1880 and 1928. Now, this what will make this question harder is all four of those things are true. So Jed's taking a push. I don't know where are you in uh, US history right now? Yeah, we actually just finished industrialization. So uh, you're not it, quite, yeah, it, okay. Yeah, we're not there quite there yet. Right, quite, quite there yet. Wait, right. So these things are all true for U.S. history. All right. But then the question is, it's like those, um, all right. Um, the question here is, it's like an ACT question in science. These will come up like, what thing is actually shown in the graph? Right. So like, how could you use the graph? Okay. So which one is, do we see here? Right. So that's right. So then it's B. Yep, <laughs> it's a true story. It's going to keep coming. Well, it's also important, like some people haven't had U.S. history yet, but some people have. And if you've had U.S. history or you had some in middle school, the U.S. is in the world, just to state the obvious. And you can always use it example as an example in your essays. It can come up in your um, questions. A couple years ago, I did a DBQ. Uh, I was a reader for the DBQ, and the most common outside evidence was U.S. there. So it's not D because of best. Now, immigrants did contribute to North American manufacturing, but this became the world's leading manufacturer. That's what the um, graph would actually show. Like, so this would be, like, how would you use the graph to prove your point? Well, if you were trying to prove the point, and part of your point was that the U.S. became the world's leading manufacturer, well, then this graph would help you to prove that point. All right. All right. Speaking of manufacturing, I found this picture, and I just I just really like it as a photograph. So that's one of the fun things about writing questions. Look at these sources. Yeah. All covered. Right, right. Yeah, follow the link that Jed dropped there, Sarthak, and you can uh, check out, um, then you'll be able to see him better. Next time I do this, I'll remember that my head will be down here. So, all right, so let's take a look at this one here. So these are silk. Yeah, so when you look at this picture, what do you see? Just, yeah, just drop some things in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's possible. Like in the document, you know, the stimulus, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There we are. What kind of textiles? What are the women working with? Oh. Right. Okay. The 
looks like, yeah, there are porcelain bowls, but if you look in the background, well, it's not cotton though. Although you're right, cotton textiles, you might pair those things in your brain. <laughs> yes, you can, we can rush through the title. And again, this is a question. That's right. Those are AMA uh, silk, and they're uh, they're also those are silk cocoons. Well, the first time I put the image up, the title wasn't there. Was I just wanted you to look at the image? But it's really important. There's, you know, I, I learned this from Dad. There's lots of clues in the titles. You can find some answers there. Um, and you know, of course, you're all. You know, you're excited or nervous or worried when you're doing the test. So you just kind of, you know, you want to get to it. But yes, it will. It's exact, this is exactly, well, I mean, obviously it won't be on a five wool branded slide, but this is just what it will look like. <laughs> All right. So if we take a look here to illustrate which of the following. So it looks like some people have said they eliminated D, which is true, because it doesn't show those things. Again, that's true. But it's not, we wouldn't use this picture to prove that. Okay, what else can we? Yeah, people are saying B or C, right? And so you can eliminate A because we don't see that. We don't know how these women live. Those are some nice dresses, um, it would seem, but and we have no idea how they live. And really, it wasn't very good. Yeah, I don't know. The answer for this one I was going for is. B, but that might be my bad. And let me tell you why. The second industrial revolution usually refers to steel and chemicals and electricity and kind of the next generation of things. But the machines here, I mean, one of the things you might notice about this picture is it's very labor intensive. Yeah. Yeah, like some sort of spinning mule in the background, right? Right. So we don't see the energy. Yeah. And I actually took this from an old AP question where you could see the energy better. Um, or actually, I originally had it. You don't need to know what I was looking at. But if you look in the background. Right. Exactly, Sonny. So this is maybe not the best. This isn't a great question because it's not that obvious because the stuff that you're looking at is in the background. But if you eliminated A and D, that's a good sign. Okay. This is a question that wouldn't make it on the exam. It wouldn't get voted on the committee. All right. How about this one? A change in Japan. So now this is where you might start doing some contextualization if you've got that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a sign. It's a bad question is what that is. All right. So now a change, when the question is asking for a change, some of the wrong answers will be things that are continuities. That makes sense? So A, is that a change or a continuity? Like, was that true in the past? Right, so silk's a continuity. Like, that was true... Like it's for you, it's true the whole class, right? You start out and unit two, you're talking about Silk Roads, right? So that's a continuity. So that means it's not a right answer here. Even though that's true, the Japanese um, gained, you know, made a lot of, a lot of the Japanese advancements were built on silk production um, using intensifying traditional things, right? Okay, somebody else also iced um, C, Right, because we don't see an emperor there. Had women been involved in textile production before? And then, so which one of these things then seems like it's a change between B and D? Right, were women making textiles, like working, make spinning, right? Well, they were. And, but what's happening here is industrialization. So in some ways you could probably, maybe not doing elimination, you look at the picture and what's it show? Well, it's a factory. So then you might just hit industrialization right away. This would be one where you might not need to do elimination. Sometimes you can see that key term. It's B, intensification of production through industrialization. Because women had been doing spinning in the, in the home and cottage industry forever. And they actually were still doing it in Japan at this time. Yeah. 
Right. It was just being done by hand. So the change is that there's factories. All right, one more. Now here's one where the stimulus is completely irrelevant. This is just a knowledge question. How is industrial, although, you know, it, it tells you we're talking about industrialization. How was industrialization in Japan different, so that's another comparison, from Britain when they first did? So again, what you're looking for, the things that are wrong answers are probably going to be things that are similarities. So it isn't A, because that's true in both cases. So how is Japan different? Right. Okay. Did young women in Brit we see young women in a factory here. Did young women work in British factories? All right. So you're eliminating that one, right? Okay. No, women did. Women did work in England, yeah. Two. So then it's going to be C. Yay, good job. So it's C, that the state, um, and this is going to be true the later that a place industrialized, the more the state will be involved. Okay, so we get even later in like communist China, communist Soviet Union, then you get to the extreme of that deal. But it's also true Belgium industrialized um, in France a little bit after Britain, and there's more state involvement. So I'm sorry, what are you asking there, Aro? What didn't, what happened earlier? Well, the state, there is some of that, but it's more indirect. So what, what I mean here is in Japan and other places, yeah, it did, but not as much. So that's the difference. And what directly invested means is building railroads, building ports, instead of those things being done in private hands, but supported indirectly by the state. So that's one of the kind of big ideas is that in places like Japan and Russia, that Egypt, that industrialized a little bit later than Britain, that there's that direct investment from the government. Yeah, well, I think laissez-faire is just an idea and the state was involved a lot more than anybody wants to own up to. So laissez-faire was an ideology or a notion. It's like, Businesses wanted it to be laissez-faire, but they also wanted the government to tax imports so that their products would sell better. They wanted laissez-faire, but they wanted the National Guard to come out and shoot at strikers if they got out of hand. So laissez-faire is, is a little more of an idea, but the earlier countries industrialized, the more that it was private capital in general. Right, exactly, Hannah. So we have that. Um, yep. Now that's also, it's a mix. It's not about like completely one way or completely another way. There's corporations are a huge deal in Japan and Japanese industrialization. It's not like they're not present. All right. So, I don't know. He might be a quiz bowl practice. He was streaming from school because he had to go to, oh, nope, it's that instead. It's on his phone now like a boss. All right, here's an imperialism question, and it is a secondary source question. So here are the things to read for in the other document. And I just have two questions for this one. And it's eight o'clock, and if people need to go, that's fine, but we haven't done imperialism yet. So I'm good hanging around, but just know if you have things or you wanna go check out Romanticism with Sherry um, for European history, you, know, you should do that. Oh yeah. Are you still invited on or do I need to reinvite you? All right. So those are the things you're looking for here. And so this is from a secondary source. It was um, a professor, part of his page. It's from a course at the University of Texas that on the history of Cairo. So the Egyptians lack the ability to finance the building of such large projects as the Suez Canal and the Egyptian railway system. They sought outside lenders who are usually British and French. The British lent the money for the railway construction. The French lent the money for the canal construction under the same terms. A British company had to build the railway and a French company would build the canal. Those companies would then operate the railway and the canal, collect the profits and use them to pay off the Egyptian debt. 
The lenders charged interest rates that were so high that the Egyptians would never get out of debt. After the U.S. Civil War ended, American cotton production resumed, cotton prices fell, and suddenly the Egyptians weren't making as much money as they had been in the past. Egypt could not afford to pay off its loans and soon began to default. And on the other document, there's more of that text that might help. Correct. <laughs> so up here it has the title. Now this guy is a historian. It's worth. There's not much opinion here. So really there's not as much sourcing to do. Oftentimes there's some with that. It's usually based on when it's written. So it's a good, this would another one. So again, this is the most common kind of question is some people were mentioning. Right. So yeah, we're getting down to B or C. Now, if you look at B, industrialized states and businesses practiced economic imperialism. So again, what's seen it? These are all things that are true about imperialism. So B is talking about economic imperialism. So if you just kind of want to, that's a big term. Like, is that it? Is that a thing? Is that what this is? And then for C, what you'll notice there is that it's talking about commodities. So the term that comes up, and I, it was actually in the quiz. Right. So are there commodities being mentioned directly in the text? Or is it more something that's generally true of economic imperialism? Like if you eliminate A and D, those are your, your choices. Yeah, yep, there isn't. So again, there's no colonies here, right? So when you see that, so it is B, and that's how you would get to the answer. This is economic imperialism. So I was trying to think of examples of economic imperialism, so I knew the Suez Canal was one. So again, this is how, like when you're reviewing, so you don't need to know that story of the Suez Canal. This is one of the things, like when we do the trivia, it's all these super specific things, right? Like, oh my gosh, I don't remember all those things. But you don't have to know all those things. You just have to be able to recognize examples of the big things. So when you look at imperialism, you should say, okay, what are the basic kinds of imperialism? Well, there's colonies and there's settlers and there's economic imperialism. Well, and you recognize economic imperialism when you see it. So you might not know anything about the Port of Buenos Aires. I don't really know that much myself. But if you saw what was going on there described, it's a lot like this. And you'd be like, and then you can recognize that as economic imperialism. Okay. Yeah, you bet, Logan. Yeah, I want you all to rock this thing. So that's the thing, you know, just always keep focusing on the big ideas. You don't have to know everything, you just need to recognize them. All right, let's speak at this one now. So this is a causation question. So it's asking what was the direct result? Okay, so here's a hot tip. So this is an effect question. So the wrong answers will sometimes be causes in a question like that. At least that's what I do when I write them. I usually put one thing in there that's the opposite. So if it's asking for difference, I usually have one of the wrong answers be a similarity. And if it's asking for causes, one of the wrong answers is an effect, or vice versa. Continuity and change, right. And it's asking for direct result, and that means it's what's going to happen right away. So, Katie, uh, um, this is my vision, right? Katie, uh, correct, that it's not C. Although that, that did happen, but not until the 50s. You can see why. They're mad. So what's this going to, going to lead to? Right, A is a cause. American cotton production increased after the Civil War. And so that led to global cotton prices to fall, which was bad for Egyptians who were selling cotton to pay off the debt. Right. So what's going to wind up happening is then it's going to be B. All right. Go through here. We have one more question. Nope, oh, that was the last one. All right. So. This here, this slide I have up as a way for you to kind of think through this. This is a pretty common, we read secondary source, I, or primary source, I think it was in the DBQ like um, 11 years ago. 
Yeah, just, just dropping truth bombs in the chat again. So you could look at this since you have the slides and think like, how would somebody generate questions for this? That is all the prepared material, but I would like to hang out for a minute or two or whatever and take any other questions that people have. She could drop into the, I think we've gone through the things that are here. Well, um, the economic imperialism was the only example that um, I had from that, but there are some replays on that and um, yep, Melissa did one last week, so you could watch that. And then Evan Little is doing one a week from tonight um, um, that's like straight up imperialism. Well, and migration, but it'll, and that will focus on causation. Okay. Yeah, you, you got this, Sarpak. Oh, didn't, yeah. All right. Well, that is all we have here tonight been over a bit, but I appreciate people hanging out. It's great seeing you all. Follow us. Stay in touch. Oh, you're welcome. Look forward to seeing folks again. I'll be chatting next week and then streaming. Well, I'm going to end the stream now, so yep, let's go yep. ahead and be in touch. Bye-bye. Again, frozen Thursdays. Nope.